again. Um, I get a lot of questions about finite element analysis, and I thought that would be a pretty good topic for at least one video, probably more, as I get farther into it. When I get questions about finite element analysis, it's never about the real nitty-gritty details. That's covered pretty well in books and papers and things like that, and sometimes even in theoretical manuals for software. The questions I tend to get more are the basic ones. Why am I doing finite element analysis? What's it good for? And what's all the fuss about? Where did it come from? Okay, what's, what's the big deal here? And those seem like pretty fair questions. I, I took a lot of finite element classes and I don't remember anybody going over those for me. Maybe they thought it was so obvious they didn't need to and I was just too thick to, to uh, notice these things on my own. So for whatever it's worth, I'm going to go over that now, right? Now, finite element analysis is a way of, well, technically it's a way of solving differential equations, but for engineers it's mostly a way of solving structural problems, although electrical engineers use it to solve uh, a lot of times electromagnetics problems. There's all kinds of, anything that's described by a differential equation, you can solve using a finite element method if you want to. I learned it as a structural analysis tool, so that's kind of how I'm going to talk about it. And that's really how it was mostly developed, at least within the aerospace industry. Okay? So let's talk first. It's, it's a way of doing structural analysis. That's, you always see that. It's a structural analysis method. Structural analysis. Okay, you see it in, in couched in those terms. Well, what does structural analysis mean? I must be doing it, but I'm not quite sure what that means. So let's, let's get that out of the way first. Let's say, let's take a really simple example. Let's say I've got a bridge, okay? And I'll put the rollers over here so that if there's a, a, a thermal change, you know, the, the, it gets really hot or really cold, that end can move because of a uh, thermal expansion. And let's put some beams in here. It's pretty obvious why I'm not a bridge designer. Let's, that's, there's probably some kind of standard truss. It's a Pratt truss or a Warren truss or something like that. So let's say I've got a bridge here, and let's say I've got a big truck going across it, okay? There. There's a big truck, and it's got a weight on it, okay? Pretty obvious why I'm not an artist, too. Okay, so let's say this is a, a big, big, big truck. Say it's 100,000 pounds, so that's what, like 45,000 kilograms, which I know is mass, not weight, but 45,000 kilograms. It's big. It's heavy, right? Now, the other thing I want to assume is it's not going very fast. I don't want inertia to matter here. I don't want dynamics to matter. This is going to be just, I'm going to talk about this as a static problem. Static means moving masses don't matter other than the extent they, they produce a weight. Okay, Inertia doesn't matter. If You can also do a dynamic analysis where you start worrying about vibrations and responses to impulses and things like that. But we don't need to worry about that yet. Okay. Quasi-static, that's what we're really assuming here. So as the bridge, or the truck moves across the bridge, there's this weight that I can watch move across the bridge, and the loads will change on the bridge as the truck moves across. So what, what do I want to know? Why would I want to mathematically analyze this, whatever that means? Well, I might want to know what the deflections are. I want to know if it's good, the bridge is going to sag or something like that. But more particularly, I probably want to know what the stresses are. Is the bridge going to fail? Is it going to dump this truck and the poor driver down into the water? So I'll put the water right there. I'm pretty sure that truck doesn't float, and I'm pretty sure that driver does not want to be in the water. So that's what I'm trying to avoid. So analysis, structural analysis anyway, is given forces or loads of forces, find deflections. and probably more important, stresses. But once you're finding one, you can find the other, right? So given forces, we want to find deflections or stresses. That's what it means to do structural analysis. Now, all we're talking about now is what tools do I have to do that with? Well, if you're in engineering school or engineering technology like I teach or any number of other fields, you learn a couple of tools and you learn them pretty much in order. Number one, we learn statics. Okay. Number two, we learn strength of materials. Well, I should have given it a shorter name, huh? And three, we learn finite elements. Actually, when I was in school about a thousand years ago, they still taught this as matrix methods, which turned out to be pretty handy. Um, but it's very closely related. 
Well, statics. Why do we do statics? Statics is easy. Well, relatively easy. Okay, statics reduces that truss we just had to basically a geometry problem, and you solve it using algebra, you know, the method of joints or method of sections. All right, so it's simple. Well, that's good. It's, uh, we can find stresses, but it's only approximate. Why statics only approximate? Well, those of you who've taken a statics course, did the words elastic modulus ever appear in that class? Did you ever calculate a deflection? Probably not, because we assume, the, the assumption over here is uh, E is infinite, okay? There is no deflection. That's why it's simple. It takes pretty gnarly mathematics and makes it a lot simpler by just saying, all right, we're not going to worry about deflections. We're just going to pretend they don't matter. So what? that's why this is approximate. Simple and approximate go hand in hand, okay? You can calculate approximate stresses, but you can't calculate them taking into, the, the, into account the effect of deflections. That's just the way statics is set up. But it's really, really handy. And if you don't believe me, go look at any bridge made before, well, certainly before World War II, before 1940 maybe. But let's go back farther than that. Before the turn of the 20th century, go find some bridge trust. Go look at the Eiffel Tower, something that was built before 1900, okay, that has lots of trust work in it, okay? Well, chances are excellent that it was designed mostly using statics. There just wasn't any other tool at the time. So people use statics and generally pretty hefty safety factors. Well, last I checked, the Eiffel Tower is still doing just fine. It's standing, survived a couple of wars and pollution and corrosion, all these other things. It's still doing fine. People still use it. Go look at the Brooklyn Bridge in New York City in the U.S. Well, that bridge was designed long before the car was around, and it's holding cars and trains and trucks and everything else. It's doing just fine, still in service. Well, it's well over 100 years old now. So clearly, statics must work. I mean, like I said, pretty hefty safety factor. Well, let's say we want a more accurate uh, type of analysis. We go to strength of materials. Now, we do take into account deflections. We do take into account the fact that uh, the elastic modulus is some finite number. Okay? Okay. Still pretty simple. Let's call it pretty simple. It's not as simple as as statics, okay? It takes into account deflections, and that's pretty useful, because all real structures deform, right? When I sit on my office chair over there, it creaks a little bit and settles a little bit. It's deforming. That's, I would actually be a little worried if it didn't. Wouldn't be very comfortable if it didn't. Okay, so it's pretty simple. Counts for deflections. Um, hard to do complex structures. Okay, what if we had that bridge I just drew up here, and I told you you had to account for all the deflections on it and calculate the stresses then? What started out as maybe a long homework problem now becomes much, much more of a big deal, okay? And that's because of elastic modulus being an actual number and not just infinite now. Deflections are something we need to account for, all right? So that brings us to finite elements. That includes the best of both worlds. We get to do, it looks simple to the user, and it doesn't always seem that way, but it is. Um, we get accurate stresses, we get deformations, we account for uh, the real stiffness of structures, the elastic modulus is part of it. We can put very complex geometries into a finite element model and it works very well, okay? So I'm just going to call this best of all worlds. plus more. You can do things with finite element analysis you couldn't begin to do with either one of those other tools. Now, in the old days, um, even almost when I was still in school, and I graduated in 1985, so the dinosaurs were still crawling out of the oceans then, I'm sure, um, people still did something else in between here. There was still a lot of analytical work going on, solving big gnarly differential equations. It was kind of the tail end of that, and I don't know if people still do that anymore or not, but certainly finite element analysis accounts for almost all the structural analysis that goes on. Now I've been talking for about nine and a half minutes here. Give me about three more minutes and I'm going to give you an example of why finite elements 
is useful, and then I'm going to stop. Okay. So let's. I was trained as an aerospace engineer. I actually learned to design airplanes rather than bridges, which is pretty cool. Um, let's take an aerospace example. There's the center line of an airplane, and there's the fuselage. Maybe it's an airliner. And so I've got a wing, all right? A big long wing. And they act kind of like beams. They get analyzed like beams. So the wing is swept, all right? And it's tapered. So it's a pretty complex beam. And of course, maybe there's, there's a big engine down there, all right? The engine weighs a lot, and it's got a force going this way, all right? And the other part about this is that the load across the, along the wing is, of course, distributed. And it's an ellipse. Well, except for maybe, let's say that there's a the control surface. The aileron is drooped a little bit so that uh, the, the plane's going to roll that way. That's a very, very routine thing. Well, this doesn't look like that anymore. It probably looks more like that. So I've got to take that out. Okay, this is a very routine problem. There's nothing unusual about this. This is something an airplane designer, I'm sorry, I got that going the wrong way, don't I? This is something an airplane designer would uh, see all the time. Okay, okay, so there we go. There's the additional uh, force from that aileron going down. I could model that as a beam. In fact, people do all the time. And here's the equation I gotta solve. Okay, I'm gonna write this down, but I'm not gonna solve it because it's awful. Um, there's that. Okay, this is the Euler beam equation, and this is at the root of all the beam analysis that we do. So this is the second derivative with respect to x, where x goes this way, okay, of E and I. Now, E is, let's just say it's all made out of aluminum. Well, E is the same all the way down here. I isn't. It tapers. So I is now a function of x. So you have to take a derivative of that. And that W there is the deflection. So W, if the, if the wing def deforms that way, okay, that, that, that uh, function there is W of x. And to solve this equation, you're trying to find a W of x that makes this true. Right? Q is the shear. Well, there's the load. You can figure out shear from that. You want to try to solve that analytically? I don't. I'm not sure I could. Well, nobody else can either. So this is where finite element analysis comes in. To solve this analytically would be a nightmare. To solve it using finite elements is actually pretty simple. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I can't analyze that whole structure. It's just too complicated. What I can do is I can start breaking it down into little pieces like that. Okay. I'll break it into the little pieces, and I can analyze any one of those little pieces. That's easy. If I can analyze all the little pieces and add them together in the right way so they're all compatible with each other and the effect on each other is, is accounted for in the math, well, it's like Legos, you know, the little blocks you build things out of? I can build an entire castle out of Lego blocks, and the Lego blocks are just these little rectangular things. Well, I can build an entire wing of an airplane out a little sort of mathematical Lego blocks, I can analyze the little blocks and I can assemble them into something as complex as I want. That's finite element analysis. That allows you to do very complicated problems. If I know the loads, I can calculate the deformations and the stresses using finite element analysis for, for problems that are way too complex to do any other way. That's the big idea. Okay.